Emily Schutz. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I've grown up here my whole life, so I'm just a Nashville native. I'm Mary Page. This is my husband, Richard. And uh, we had Jessica in 1984. So I guess we were five at the time. Um, and she had the same kindergarten teacher as I. And um, so we hit it off in school and then realized that we lived like two streets away from each other. So we were able to just kind of knock back and forth to each other's houses and we became the best little friends. Jessie hated school um, all the way up through high school. Now, college she enjoyed, but she really hated school. She, she would rather just have been home home with me. She was hilarious. She was fun. She was vivacious. She was um, She was just an amazing person all around. She was one of those people that you wanted to be and you wanted to be like. Jessie was, uh, her goal in life was to be a soccer mom. Um, she was actually going to college to become a nurse. <clears throat> but she chose that profession, uh, one, because she, she was very much a caretaker and two, because it was flexible and, and she knew that, that she would have some flexibility with having children. She wanted babies, she wanted to be married. She had simple goals. She didn't want to be wealthy. She didn't want to, she didn't have to have a, you know, expensive car. And that's all it would have taken to make Jesse Page happy. He was an extremely generous person from the time she was a small kid. My mom used to ground me from Jesse, like forget about the phone or the TV, you're grounded from Jesse. So uh, that, that always hurt the worst because we had a lot of awesome things to get done. So they were together constantly. If we went on vacation, Emily went with us. If we went to a family reunion, Emily went with us. If whatever we were doing, Emily had to be there. They were extremely close. She always spoke her mind. Um, she was, again, she was hilarious. She was funny. She spoke her mind. She was a beautiful person inside and out. She would take the shirt off of her back for anybody and do anything for anyone. She loved, uh, I mean, I know everybody says that about their loved one that, that dies, that's normal to say, but this girl had it right. Like she had everything, I just feel like she had it right really early um, and knew what was most important and knew what family meant and knew what she wanted to do and be and who she was. Um, she had been married for seven weeks when she died. She had dated Brian for six years. She started dating him um, when she was a senior in high school. She met him that Christmas at Emily's house. He was a friend of Emily's cousin who was also in the Army. They were both at Fort Campbell. And Brian wasn't going to be able to go home that Christmas, so his uh, Emily's cousin invited him to come down on Christmas Eve for the big get together. And of course, Jesse always went. And I'll, I'll never forget it. She came home that night. And when she opened the door, she just fell against it and threw her head back. And she was 17. She said, oh my God, Mama, I just met the most gorgeous guy. And I said, well, you did? At the Baker's? Who, who was it? And she said, oh, Mama, he's out of my league. I said, honey, 
no one's out of your league. I said, you know, why don't you tell me about him? Well, then she told me that he was, uh, let's see, he was three years older than Jesse, so he would have been 20, and uh, that he was in the, in the Army. So I said, ooh, you know, that's a little bit old for you since he's been in the Army for a while. That's a little bit old for you. Um, and I didn't think a whole lot about it until maybe a week, possibly a week passed. And she told me that he had called her and wanted to go out. And apparently, uh, Emily's cousin, who was very protective of Jesse, just like he was his young female cousins. He had withheld Jesse's phone number as long as, as he could. And uh, because he thought that he was too old for it too. And uh, it didn't work. She was, um, she was just a, one of the most compassionate people that I've ever known. She would have made a good nurse. On October 26, 2008, in Davidson County, Tennessee, Wesley Parker Ellis recklessly did kill the victim, Jessica M. Page, by the operation of a motor vehicle, the killing of Jessica M. Page being the proximate result of the intoxication of Wesley Parker Ellis, and the probable cause is as follows. Wesley Ellis was the driver of a vehicle involved in a traffic crash. Subject had an obvious odor of an alcoholic beverage coming from about his person, bloodshot and watery eyes, slurred speech, and admitted to drinking. Subject was asked to perform the three SFSTs. Subject showed indicators of impairment on the HGN and OLS, but stated he couldn't do the walk and turn. Subject was believed to be under the influence of alcohol. Subject was taken into custody and transported to General Hospital for a blood draw. A few reckless decisions that I didn't make have crippled my whole life. I've been robbed of my soulmate, Jesse. Jesse and I share an entire lifetime's worth of joy, but we also share in being Wesley Ellis' victims. I held her as she died, full of life and love. We shared everything, every moment. We should not have had to share that one. We were we weren't supposed to end this way. Many times when people die that we love, we forget their shortcomings and we attempt to be out of them. These young women weren't perfect. They epitomized, epitomized the word human. They lived to the fullest. They loved with passion. They laughed with sheer joy. They were invincible. That all came to an end because Mr. Ellis decided to drink and drive. I will not call what happened to Jesse and Emily an accident. Accidents, by definition, are events that cannot be prevented. This event was a conscious effort on the part of the defendant. The homicide of my daughter and the injury of Emily could have been prevented. 
everything that I have read and heard indicates to me that she was an incredible woman who showed to everybody, people she loved and the people she barely knew, and maybe even people she didn't know but just bumped into, that she was uh, full of compassion and caring, and that she was always giving. And I hope through this sentence that we can somehow or another, in her name and honor, uh, give to other families uh, the uh, ability to avoid being here today, that she will give life by teaching someone that drinking and driving is an evil that just cannot keep going on. Uh, and hopefully, while it's clear that her life cannot be brought back, maybe we can save someone else's life. We all have to look out for our neighbor. When you get on the road and you're drinking, you're not looking out for your neighbor. You're not looking out for yourself. But if you get out drinking and driving and you kill yourself, that's sad. It's, it's horribly sad for your family. It's a whole different world when you get out drinking and driving and you decide that you're going to take someone else's life into your hands. I think it's important to know that it's not that alcohol is bad. You know, it's 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 fun. It's enjoyable. You you know, um, it can be fun to to drink. Um, but the the problem is 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 driving home or driving somewhere with it. And again, the impact that that can make on your life is just not worth it. Um, it's fine to do it, but call and get someone to bring you home and make sure that you are able to get home safe. Um, so this, this one small choice I made has affected many, many people and I hope now I can affect you guys in a positive way. So, so, so to, the, to the day of the crash, the day of the crash started out normal. I went out, uh, I went out on a lunch date with my mom and while we were out, you know, we had a good time. We were just hanging out. And then once that wrapped up, some of my friends from school called. And uh, I was living in the dorms at the time. And all you guys are in the dorms now here, right? I'm assuming. So you know how it is. Right down the hallway, everybody's staying. So some guys, it was like, walk out of my dorm room, go down the hall a few, few doors on, to the left. And it was some guys down there I hung out with a lot. So they called me and they're like, hey, Wes, you want to go to a, a costume party? And it was right around Halloween. So... At the time, I was, you know, I was wide open, happy-go-lucky, just did whatever I wanted all the time. So, of course, I was, you know, yeah, I want to go to a Halloween costume party. Let's do it. So they're like, all right, you know, hit me up when you get back to school. So I finished up with my mom, went back to school. I, uh, I went down there and started talking to them, and they're like, hey, uh, you know, we got we to gotta have somebody drive to the party. And I was like, well, they're like, will you do it? Because I had a big truck. And, I was like, yeah, I guess if we'll stay there. And they're like, yeah, we're going to stay there. We've talked to them. It's not a problem. I was like, all right, that's, that's a plan. Let's do it. So we end up going to the party. I'm there for a few hours. I've had several drinks. And around 1230, I look around, and I don't see my friends anywhere. I call them. They're not answering the phone. I don't know where they're at. And I'm sure if any of you guys have been to a party where you didn't know anyone and none of your friends were there, it's just really uncomfortable. 
So I'm just like, whatever, I'm leaving, I'm going home. And around, you know, it was around 12.30, 1 o'clock. So uh, that's when I made the choice to get behind the wheel after having several, several drinks. And that essentially, you know, sealed the fate for Jessica and, and resulted in her death. So when I got in the car, I jumped on. It's called Brawley Parkway in Nashville. It's this big, big highway. It's really big. It was late at night. Nobody was on the road. So I just got on there, and I was blasting along, going like, 75, 80 miles an hour, you know, really, really speed and didn't have a care in the world. I, I couldn't even comprehend what was, you know, in store for me just a few miles down the road. So as I'm driving along, you know, I'm just not even worried about anything. And I, I come up on this intersection called, it's the intersection of Brawley Parkway and Volte Boulevard. It's a four-way intersection with a stoplight, or a, yeah, stoplight. And um, as I'm coming up to the intersection, I notice a car at the intersection, um, to my right, and um, so I'm speeding up on the intersection, not paying attention, and I'm driving a Dodge Neon, so it's a, or a uh, Ford Expedition, so it's a big truck, and the car was a, that Jessica was driving was a Dodge Neon, and um, I look away, not paying attention that I had a red light, and blasted right into the intersection. Well, Jessica had a green light, she pulled into the intersection, and as it came up on the intersection, I, I looked back and I saw what was happening, so I slammed on my brakes and uh, swerved to the right. And I'd, I'd played it out a thousand times in my head before. If that happened to me, I would swerve behind them, they would keep going, nothing would even happen, you know. But that's not what happened because she did like, you know, any normal person would when you see a car coming towards you when you're coming into an intersection and slammed on her brakes. And when she did, you know, I just plowed right into her door. And you guys saw the picture. I mean, it was, it was a really, really hard hit right in her driver's side door. So when I, when I hit her, her car spun around facing me and, and went and reversed down the road for maybe 120 yards or so. And, um, you know, at first I'm just like, oh, man, you know, like, what was that? Crap. And I pull over and to show you guys how clouded uh, alcohol makes your judgment. The first thing I did, you know, when I pulled over, I get out of my car and I go up to the front and I'm looking at it. And I'm thinking to myself like, oh man, my radiator, you know, my radiator's busted. This, this sucks. Um, and after a minute or so, I start thinking to myself, well, maybe w there's another car. I need to go down there. And that's when I, I went down to Jessica's car and that's when I started to realize that things were pretty serious because when I got down there, her car was in the ditch like you saw, kind of reversed in. And um, as I walked up on the car, her driver's side window was busted out. The front windshield was all cracked and splintered. And uh, I looked in and I saw, I could see Jessica. She was laying over her friend, Emily. And um, I remember just the, there were cries coming out of the car. And I'll never forget, uh, Jessica was, was so pale, you know. And, and it turns out, I imagine that's from when I hit her, it broke all the ribs in her body and punctured all her internal organs and she had horrible bleeding. So um, I imagine that's what that's a result of. But I realized quickly, you know, it was really, really serious. People were calling the police and stuff. So I just thought, you know, I'm gonna go sit down at my car. Um, so I turn around, I go sit down at my car, I call my parents, they show up. And of course the police showed up and they gave me a sobriety test and I failed because I was drunk and they put me in handcuffs and took me away from my family and the scene right there. And um, they took me to the hospital. They stuck needles in my, in my arms and drew blood and just checked for alcohol and then they took me to the jail. And it's just like you see on TV. When you go into the jail, you walk in and um, they take your picture and then take your fingerprints and then they strip you down butt naked and put you in an orange jumpsuit and put you in a room with you know, 160 other men that are really, you know, just angry at the world. And uh, for a 19-year-old kid who was a freshman in college, this was all extremely traumatizing, you know. So after about 12 hours, my family bonded me out, and that's when I started the whole court process. And that lasted for 16 months or so, and uh, that's all very, very traumatic as well because it dredges up a lot of emotions and whatnot. But at the at the end of that, it culminated in the sentencing, and you guys saw a clip of the sentencing hearing. And I ended up getting sentenced to a year in prison, and then I have to do speaking engagements for several years, and I'm on probation for a long time. But 
the day I walked into the sentencing hearing, the, you know, it was, it's, it's really crazy the contrast that your, you know, your choices and your decisions can make because the day I walked into the sentencing hearing, the night before I slept in my own bed, I walked in wearing a suit and a tie and I walked out of there and was put in an orange jumpsuit and I put on a metal bed and in a room with a bunch of other men and um, it, it became quickly evident, you know, how my choices were really catching up to me. Eventually, they shipped me off to the, uh, to the prison. They, I got put in a cell, you know, like you see on TV. It was a cell with two beds, a toilet in the room, another guy, a desk. So, you know, anytime somebody had to use the bathroom, you're locked in a room while they're using the bathroom and whatnot. And it was, uh, it was a, long, a long time in, in prison. You, you know, you lose a lot of humanity, and you really have a lot of time to think about your actions and your choices. And there were times where... Um, you know, I went two weeks without being out of the cell, or 13 days, I believe it was, because there was a huge gang fight, and it was just a horrible, horrible deal, and they thought it was better to keep people in their rooms than let them out and risk that again. Another time, I went two or three months without going outside. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a different world. And, you know, eventually I got out, though, and I thought things would start looking up. I went to school. I got an associate's degree. I got a bachelor's degree. You know, I'm I did some things that, um, you know, were advancing me forward in my life, but I quickly realized, too, that the repercussions of my actions were going to follow me from that one choice. You know, I have been unable to find a job because of my record. I, um, you know, I see daily the emotional turmoil it causes in my family, depression, anxiety, fear of the unknown. All of those things follow me. I've got a, you know, since I've been out, I've, I've got a GPS monitor on my ankle. I want you all to see this. So I have people monitoring my movements 24 hours a day, and I have a 6 p.m. curfew. Um, I'm on probation until my late 30s, for sure. And financially, it's just really, really strapped me. Um, all of these things, you know, are horrible, but none of them outweigh Jessica's life. And I deserve everything I've done. I really do. And I, I recognize that. But I want you guys to recognize that the smallest, you know, choice you make can result in just the biggest, you know, repercussions for your actions. Beyond myself, you know, I, I mentioned my family. Um, you know, I see all the emotional turmoil it's caused and the depression, and I really shamed them with my actions because I was on television, I was on the news and whatnot. I had a little brother. I don't know if you guys, anybody in here have a little brother? Anybody? Yeah, so, you know, you're his role model, his hero probably, and I was, I was my little brother's role model and hero, and it was, it's really been a lot for me to deal with, you know, for example, having to deal with my brother realizing I am flawed, you know, his hero, his big brother is, is, is human, you know, and that, that was a lot to deal with because, you know, you want to be a good, a good mentor, but it's hard to be when you make such horrible, horrible choices. But, you know, before I go and open it up for questions, I want to leave you guys with, uh, with a little advice. Um, you know, for someone who's been exactly where you are, listening to someone in a room, talk about this stuff, but now I'm the one doing the speaking. I promise you don't want to be where I am because it really, you know, you can just throw everything out the window that you had aspiration-wise for your life. The, um, the thing is, it just keeps on going and going and going. And at the time, I didn't look back, you know, at the time I didn't realize that my choices have such big influences on the people around me and, you know, the world around me. And I wish I would have because such a small, small choice can result in someone dying. And the choice I made to drink and drive was a choice. And I also want you guys to realize that driving is a privilege. You know, you have to earn your license. You have to take a test for your license. And with that privilege comes responsibility to other people on the road, to your family, to yourselves. So you can't just be out there living on the edge because eventually you're going to go over the edge. And people die when bad choices are made. And, you know, not only do people die, but 
people are left with that void that you cause in their life. So don't end up like me. Don't drink and drive and understand you have the power to make a choice. So make the right choice, make the positive choice, and you know, be leaders in your community. Lead by example, set the tone. You're here because you're all leaders. So show people you know, how they should go about their lives and influence those people around you.